if you go to camera settings, uh, first of all, I have this scene here with, you can see there's a camera right in the middle of the scene. And then I have a bunch of these little ships floating around in the middle there. And you'll see the renders later on from this. Um, so if you go to camera settings, and you go to lens here, you have two new options here. So lat long stereo and fisheye stereo lenses. And we're mainly going to talk about the latitude longitude stereo lens here, which is basically the same as the cylindrical lens here, which lets you render a 360 view, uh, except that it adds a sort of a special camera rig that lets you do these virtual reality depth enhanced 360 views. So if you choose that long stereo, that's all you have to do basically. And I'm going to walk you through these parameters here for the uh, lat long stereo camera. You can see that it adds this new section here as long as you, as soon as you pick that option. Okay. So the first option is whether you want to render the center camera, which is basically going to be this camera. Just uh, this can be useful as a sort of a reference frame. Uh, but to create the stereo virtual reality image, you really only need the left and the right views. So this is basically three cameras or two cameras, sorry, the left and the right view, which sort of mimic our two eyes. And then the two images are slightly displaced. And when you put them together and use um, a virtual reality viewer, such as Google Cardboard, which is probably the cheapest option you have, and it, apparently it's pretty good, uh, it will sort of combine or show you on the screen those two separate images, one for the left eye and one for the right eye. Okay, so you render these separately, or you could just render them one after the other in Maxwell. And I'm also going to show you uh, a script that was written by the guy who basically helped uh, Maxwell render to create this lens shader. I'm going to show you a site in a minute. Um, so the parameters you have here. First, the field of view, the horizontal and vertical field of view, you should leave these at the defaults because 180 degrees vertical and 360 degrees horizontal means you want a complete 360 view exactly the same as the usual cylindrical view here. So you don't need to change these. Uh, these two, the flip ray X and Y, this simply lets you flip the image horizontally or vertically if you would wish to do that depending on your scene. Um, this one, however, is pretty important, and it's the parallax distance of your two renders, meaning that the parallax distance will really be the distance where you won't see any depth effect anymore. So if you imagine, if you look at the scene from the top, and let's say this scene has a, about a 10 meter uh, diameter, if you set the parallax distance to the default here, which is three, 360 centimeters, that means that at about here, those two cameras are going to converge so that at the distance of 360 centimeters, you won't see any depth. And any objects that are farther away from the parallax distance will seem as being farther away into the, into the screen with which you're viewing your, your virtual reality images. And the objects that are closer to the camera than this distance are going to seem like they're popping out uh, from the screen. So really, you should set this distance depending on what your scene is and um, how much of a sort of a 3D stereo effect you would like. Um, for example, in this scene, it would maybe make sense to leave it at half the area of interest or half of what the total scene is so that you have parts of the model that are going to seem like they're moving away from you. Okay. Um, the zenith mode uh, lets you sort of flip the camera upwards 
So instead of rendering something flat like this, depending if you have a scene where you have uh, maybe something interesting that goes on up here instead of horizontally like this, then you would maybe better be using Zenith mode so that you have a better idea of what's going on in the renders at the top of your scene because otherwise the top here is going to look pretty weird. You can see here from the renders, from the resulting renders. Okay, if I leave it without Zenith mode, you can see that at the top here, it's going to get very, very stretched because this is later on going to be projected on a spherical surface. So that's why it can look weird like this. Um, so that's what the Zenith mode is for, basically. If you have interesting things going on at the top and you want to make it easier for yourself to edit the image, then use Zenith mode because it's going to look less stretched. And instead, it's going to be the horizontal area that's going to look stretched. Okay. The next parameter that's important is the separation. So this is basically, basically the distance between the average, the average distance between two eyes, the two eyes <laughs> in our head. So if you increase this parameter, it will have the effect of increasing the depth effect, the stereo depth effect. But be careful not to increase it too much because that can uh, make people, you know, feel uh, disoriented. It may strain the eyes. And especially if you have objects that are very close to the camera, you should be careful not to set this parameter too high also. And the basic rule is that you should divide uh, the parallax distance with a certain number to uh, to have your separation distance. And the rule is that you can divide the parallax distance between something around 30 and 120. If you divide it by 30, that will give you a very large separation value, meaning you will have a big depth effect. If you divide it by 120, you will have a very subtle depth effect. So let's see if I... If I divide 360 by 120, you get 3. So then I would enter that here. So if you want to have sort of a medium uh, depth effect, you would divide the parallax distance by something like 50, and then you would get your separation distance. So it depends, of course, on the size of your scene. If you have a very small scene, then, of course, the separation distance needs, needs to be smaller as well. The last parameter that's important for this particular lens is the separation map. Uh, the separation map is simply a black and white texture that lets you decide which areas of your render are going to have that 3D stereo effect and which areas are not supposed to have that stereo effect. So why do you need that map? And I'm going to show you that you can create it also with the gradients. So I just clicked on the texture chip here and choose new gradient 3. And I'm going to deactivate the U direction and activate the V direction. And I'm going to set this one to black and this one to black as well and the middle to white. So it's a black and white texture that you need. And it needs to look something like this. And this uh, map tells the renderer that where the map is white, you're going to have the maximum uh, 3D effect meaning it's going to take into account your parallax distance and the separation distance. And as the gradient turns darker and darker, up here at the top, you don't want to have any 3D effect. It's just like you're using the regular cylindrical camera. This is because when you're looking at the top towards the zenith, so that's the top or the nadir that's at the bottom, you don't want to have that 3D stereo effect because if you do, you're going to have this weird sort of, we can call them artifacts, I guess, of the lens shader up here at the top and the bottom where you don't want that separation effect. You want it to diminish eventually to zero, zero uh, when you're looking at the top and the bottom. So that's why you need that uh, separation map. And again, you can just either create this in Photoshop and load it as a bitmap texture, or you can just go ahead and use the gradient procedural texture, which is a bit more convenient. 
Okay, and let me just try to load these two renders I've done already to show you a viewer. And actually, let me just show you first the page of the guy who helped write the um, the lens shader, so this virtual reality lens shader. And I really suggest that you visit his website. So his name is Andrew Hazelden. And he has a lot of information about everything related to virtual reality. So he has a bunch of tools. Uh, some are free, some are uh, not free. He's developed a tool for uh, rendering, for example, the Maya viewport using the graphics card for quick previews of virtual reality renders. And he also wrote two scripts I'm going to show you for Maxwell that make it a little bit easier to visualize uh, 3, 360 renders uh, from Maxwell. Uh, so anyway, I really suggest visiting his blog if you're interested in this virtual reality stuff. So I'm just going to load One MXI file, let's see. I have the render for this. Switch that post. Actually, if you look on his blog, you can find the script. Actually, just let me first show you the render. Okay, so this is what you get when you render with the stereo lens shader. So this is the left view. And he wrote a little script. And so you go to the scripting, load script, and then you browse to wherever you, you put that script. And, and it's called panel view. You load that script. And this is actually, it's going to load a virtual reality viewer, and you have a bunch of them available. And he wrote also the instructions in, in the script. And so by default, this is the viewer that's chosen, Color Eyes, and it's free for download on this website, color.com, Color Eyes. And if you want to use any of these other ones, you can change the line in the script here. Uh, this one here. No, oh, sorry, not that one. Uh, I'm not sure where that is. <laughs> Somewhere in the script. Oh, it's this one. Okay. So here you can choose at the top here, choose the media of your either colorize or any of these other ones. So you can comment out with two forward slashes the default one and then you can uncomment the one that you want to use. And some of these have the advantage that it, they let you load also EXR images because the colorize one, it only supports uh, JPEGs or PNG. So it doesn't support EXR images in case you render in. 32-bit or 16-bit. But I'm just going to show you with the color eyes of viewer. So I just click run to run the script. And it's going to load. Oops. Let me just paste in the the file here because it wasn't pasted and that's why the script got confused. So loading the script and then just running it. Weird. Well, it's going to automatically load the render you have. Uh, 
uh, you have set the render path you have set in the uh, in the image output here. Uh, so then you can quickly just visualize your scene using the colorize uh, VR viewer. Okay, and if you you can also load a, a a stereo image, and I'm going to show you how to assemble these two left and right images to create a stereo image, so that if you have some like uh, heads up display, uh, like again the Google Cardboard thing, you can use this viewer to view your image with a with a depth effect. But anyway, it's a nice tool to have to just quickly view your your render that everything looks okay and so on, and you have a bunch of effects here. You can turn it to old TV screen if you want. And then control Q to exit out of this viewer. Okay, so that's the first script that Andrew wrote to make it a little bit easier to view your, your renders from Maxwell. And the second script he wrote and I think this is going to be available from either the Maxwell Render website, the forum, or his own blog, but it's not quite finished yet. But it's a Python script. So I'm going to run Python for Maxwell. This is included with every install for Maxwell. And you go to File, Open, and you open the script. And again, it has a bunch of instructions on how to use it. And what you're interested in is at the bottom of the script. So you need to change the file of the MXS file. And then you have to specify the, uh, the path for that separation map texture. And that's all you need to do, really. And this script will take your scene and it will automatically create two left and right MXS files. And it will apply the separation map and it will also um, calculate a, a separation uh, distance parameter based on the uh, depth ratio that you set here. So again, I mentioned a range between 30 and 120 to divide the parallax distance width. So in this case, by default, the script is set to 55, so it's going to be sort of like a, a medium uh, stereo effect. Okay, and then it's going to go through those scenes and it's going to... Um, so I can run the script and it's going to start rendering those scenes for you automatically. So it's a little bit more convenient than you having to, you know, create those scenes by yourself and starting the renders manually. It just makes it a little bit more convenient. So I'm going to stop this one. I think the second one is going to start. So, if I just load that script again. Uh, anyway, you're going to have the script available to you, I, th I guess, by the forum and on Andrew's blog as well when, when he decides that it's good enough to be released. And you can also decide here exactly which views you want to render. If you don't want to render also the center view, then just remove it from this function here at the bottom. So right now it's set to render all three views. And again, the center view is only needed for your reference. Uh, you don't need to render it in, in order to create those stereo view renders. So now after you have these renders, what do you do with them to be able to view them on something like YouTube in case you have an animation or just to view them in a viewer? Uh, what you need to do is actually you have several options with these images. So let me load the left one as well. So now I have the left view and the right view. And you can see that they're slightly different one from the other. And that's what's going to create the stereo effect. 
If you want a really quick way to see the stereo effect, you can get also, besides the Google Cardboard glasses, you can get one of those very cheap uh, cyan and red glasses, which you've probably seen if you went to a 3D movie, they give you those cheap, you know, cardboard uh, 3D glasses. And to, in order to mimic that with your renders, what you need to do is simply load one of the renders into the other one. So basically, you want to create that sort of a cyan red look. You may be familiar with it. And in order to do that, you can choose here on the top layer. You can go to blending options and just uncheck the red channel here for the top one. Okay, so basically the bottom one is going to be your red channel and then the top one, top one is going to be the cyan channel because you've unchecked the, uh, the red channel here. You're only going to have the green and the blue show up. So then you have your sort of an anaglyph image it's called and then when you put on those cardboard glasses with the sign and the red lenses, you're going to get that 3D effect. So that's a quick way to check uh, the amount of, of 3D effect that you will have in your render you know, using this method. Um, but a more common method, if you want to uh, show these images on the web, or even if you have an animation and you want to do a you want to upload it to YouTube, and by the way, their 360 video player now also su supports stereo um, 360 videos. So it's a very nice way for you to showcase your animations uh, through video uh, using the stereo lens shader. So a more common workflow for that is that you will double the canvas size. So one method is that you will double it horizontally so that you will have basically instead of a two by one ratio, you will have a four by one ratio. So here I'm going to increase the canvas size by 200%. Then next to this one, I'm going to paste the other eye render. Okay, so there you have the ones two by side by side and then you would upload this to a web viewer and then it knows to display half of the screen to display the left image and for the other half, for the other eye, it was going to display the right image. So that's one format. So this is a four by one ratio. Another option you have, and again there's no really there's there's no real standard about this because it's just the way, you know, new technology works out. People want to do it their own way. So then you don't really have a, you have many standards, not one standard. The other way is to put them over and under. So again, I'm going to change the height this time. And then just copy paste this one here. Okay, so that's yet another format that you can use and uh, I th think this works for example for the Gear VR heads-up display. Uh, their frames are going to look like this. So in that case you're going to export your animation or your still frame, you're going to export it like this. Um, yet another concern with these videos is that imagine if you have a video frame that's the usual 16 by 9, Let me just make this a more common common format. So your average average video frame, which is 16 by 9, which is also what YouTube expects, for example, it's going to be something like this. Okay? So for bandwidth reasons, or if you want to do your if you want to uh, put your virtual reality video on a DVD, uh, which you're going to show on a 3D TV or stuff like that, they actually expect you to, to give the content in a format that's not wider than the common DVD format. So it's either 1980 by 1020 or it's 
2080 by 720. So it's either 1080p or 720p. So what you need to do in that case is to actually squeeze your two renders that are side by side in this case. You need to squeeze them in order to fit into that uh, into that uh, format. Okay, so your final your final um, content is going to look like this. And then the viewer is going to take care to de-squeeze these two images so that they again look like this. Okay, now the process is that if you do this, of course, you're going to lose a little bit of quality because you're half the resolution now. Horizontally, it's half the resolution, so you have, you know, half of the amount of pixels. So you're going to lose a little bit of quality. So what you can do then, a little trick, is to actually render at half the horizontal resolution in that case and still have a 360 render because Again, since it's already going to be squeezed like that to half the width, um, you can save half your render time. Uh, actually, let me show you this a little better. If I do a um, top to bottom render, so... Okay, so imagine you have your two renders like this. If you want to send them to a, to a DVD or even on YouTube to save on the bandwidth, so you would, in this case, again, squeeze them by approximately half in the height this time if you're using this format, right? So taking a look at these individual renders now, what happens is that each of them now are actually four by one. Okay, means that you've halved their, you've set their vertical dimension in half. So instead of rendering them at full size, meaning two by one ratio, you can instead set the camera here at the resolution. Okay, so let's say this was 2000 by 1000. You can actually lower the horizontal resolution by half or, or vertical resolution by half in this case in the case that you're going to use the over or up under format. Okay, so in that case, just from the beginning, lower the uh, vertical resolution to half. So instead of 1000 in this case, I set it to 500. And this means that I'm going to get about half uh, the render time compared to sending this to 1000 because I've lowered the amount of pixels by 50%. So in that case, I get half the render time. Uh, so then, you know, you're, you're getting these renders pre-squeezed, <laughs> pre so to speak, because they're going to wind up in this format 4x1 anyway. You know, you're losing quality anyway, so then why not just save yourself half the render time and have them pre-squeezed, and then when you're going to set them um, like this, one on top of the other, they're going to look the way they should be. They're going to look like this anyway. Okay? So that's one small tip in case you want to save some, some bandwidth when you upload your virtual reality uh, animations. But again, in the case that you have a viewer or you have a, you know, a system where, you don't, where they don't require you to have this sort of compression, because of the bandwidth, then of course you would use the highest quality and you would render it as a two by one ratio render to have the highest quality. Uh, and finally, something to mention about uh, the actions in Photoshop. So Andrew again, he wrote a bunch of actions for Photoshop that make it a little bit easier to to work with um, 
these kinds of images. And you can again find them on his blog. So they're called Dome Master Photoshop Actions Pack. I have all these bunch of actions to make it faster and easier for you to work with with uh, 360 images. So you load the actions here by going to the menu and then just load actions after you download his action file. And to make it easier for you to see what all these actions do, you can go up to the same menu here and choose button mode. So then you see them, see the actions as buttons. So here you have a bunch of transformations. Uh, for example, if you want to turn this equirectangular render, which is what this is, to a angular fisheye, you can just click this action and it turns it into this one, sorry, not this one, this one, two by one equirectangular to angular fisheye. Okay, and that can make it easier, for example, if you want to edit the, the bottom or the top of your render by switching it to this format. And to do that, you will actually first rotate it. So at the bottom, you have a bunch of transform options. So you rotate it 180 degrees, and then you would use that action. So now you would be looking, I think, at the top, sorry, the bottom of the render, and then you can edit that, you know, a little bit easier. And then you can just rotate it back. Oops. And then switch it back to angular fisheye to two by one AQ rectangular. And I think I flipped it too much now. Yeah, like that. Okay. So now you've edited the, the bottom of the of the render. Oops. Rotate it back. Uh, another cool thing you can have with these actions is that if you first transform it to angular fisheye and then from that you can invert it and then you can create these cool um, if you saw those little planet uh, 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 images or you can invert it to, to sort of make it seem like you're looking at it from a tube. It's not so evident in this render, unfortunately, but if you were to render something like an outside scene with buildings and you, uh, you first pick equirectangular to angular and then inverse it, inverse the angular fisheye, you would get that little planet effect, which can be pretty cool. So anyway, there are lots of tools here that are very useful. Finally, I'll just set it back to normal. Um, let me see. There's an offset here. So for example, the horizontal offset, if you want to change the center of your render, you can do that from here. Okay, so you can change what the center is going to be of your of your virtual reality tour with this option. Uh, anyway, it's there's a bunch of useful tools in here, again from Andrew. So hopefully that gives you an idea of how to use the stereo lens. And I know I haven't talked at all about the fisheye stereo lens, and that's um, it's a little bit more complicated because it involves more parameters and it's basically it's for when you want to display your content in one of those dome theaters okay and you have to have a little bit uh, a few more maps because the people who who sit in those chairs that are sort of like <laughs> lounge chairs they may be tilting their heads so you have to have a special tilt map and so on but 
in any case, I just wanted to give you an intro of the lens, of the lat long stereo lens, which is probably what you're going to use. And if you if you intend to show your content in, you know, dome in those dome theaters, then you should know what these do <laughs> anyway before you get started on that. And uh, the documentation is probably going to be updated as well uh, to to show you exactly what these head turn maps and head tilt maps are going to look like. So that's why I haven't really mentioned this too much. But you can see that the separation here parameter is the same. The dome radius, that's sort of the same as the parallax distance. Um, the dome tilt, this is if that dome in the theater is not completely horizontal but it's tilted a little bit then you can specify that angle here. Uh, so yeah that's a little bit about the, the fisheye stereo lens but I think for our purposes you know you're going to be using this lens almost all the time. Right so let's see okay well oh, time is flying. Um, yeah so that's about the stereo lens and hopefully I was pretty clear. I get confused sometimes but <laughs> hopefully that was okay. So moving on now to the some of the new output options and just a little bit of intro on how you can composite uh, the different channels together and the few options you should take care of in the object properties when you want to composite an object over a, a background for example. So here I have a scene with a backdrop and there are a bunch of emitters. You can see these are spotlight emitters, the new spotlight emitters in version 3 and here I have a bunch of usual uh, emitter planes and the idea is that I want to render this on a, on a backdrop but I want to make the backdrop invisible uh, I'm just using it as a shadow catcher so that I have a shadow which I can then composite over any color background that I want so if I just set up the scene like this I set the backdrop material if I go to global properties, I set the shadow channel on and then in the render options, I just check the shadow channel. So, you know, in essence, that's all you would have to do, but you'll see that there are a few more things we have to take care of because if I were to render this, You're going to see a few problems with the shadow channel. So here you have the two channels, the main render channel and the S, which stands for shadow channel. So the first problem is, of course, the emitters are visible in the, uh, in the shadow channel, which we don't necessarily want. The second problem is that the camera itself is taking out parts of the shadow channel, which may seem okay, but I'm going to show you why that's, that can be a problem. Because basically you want the entire uh, geometry of the camera to be invisible to the shadow channel so that you get the shadow also where the camera is supposed to be. And Another problem is that we get these shadows here that are cast from these emitter planes. So this emitter here on the left is casting light towards this direction. And so, of course, we get a shadow from this emitter on the backdrop here, which we basically, we just want this to be completely white because we just want the shadow to be from the camera. So how do we fix those problems? And, well, a third problem is that if I also want the alpha channel to cut out this object from the backdrop, you're going to see that the alpha channel is going to be completely white because it's taking into account um, 
the backdrop as well, and that's that's not what we want. Okay, so you can see you, you can't really use that to cut out the camera because it's completely white. So the first thing we need to do is select the backdrop and set it to hidden from camera. So if it's hidden from camera, it's still going to affect the shadow channel. So that's okay. So that's what that that's what we need to do for the backdrop. Now, for the problem regarding the shadow that was visible in the shadow channel from these two emitters, uh, what we need to do for those are two things. First, we need to select their geometry, and we need to hide them from camera, and also so that their shadow isn't cast on the backdrop itself, we also need to hide them from global uh, illumination. Okay, and then we're not going to see their shadow in the shadow channel. Um, actually, no, no shadow is going to be cast on the, on the backdrop. And finally, we can also hide them in the shadow channel so that their white out outline here doesn't appear. So it's these three settings we need to set for them uh, in this case. And finally, to fix the problem, that the camera itself was sort of hiding the shadow channel here and just to show you why that's a problem is that if you later try to composite the cutout of that camera over your shadow you're going to get a problem because of anti-aliasing and this means that if I for example cut out this area here from this render and I just sort of try to composite it in, so to speak, or paste it in exactly where it was, I'm not going to be able to do that, even if I set it exactly where it's supposed to be. So here, okay, you can see that I still get this outline here. It's impossible to paste it back exactly without getting this outline here, and that has to do with the aliasing, okay, at the, at the edges here. And we're going to have the same problem with that camera and the shadow channel if the camera is sort of hiding the shadow channel where it's not supposed to hide it and the composite is going to have that little edge here so that edge instead of looking black it's going to look white because the the shadow channel is going to be white in that area so how to avoid that you need to use this option here the hide the camera geometry to the camera in the shadow channel. Okay, so I'm just going to select all the objects. Hey, Mihai. Hey. Yeah? Jana here. I'm very yeah. sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to tell you that we only have a few minutes left if you want to wrap it yeah, up yeah. a little bit. Yeah, I'm just going to have 10 minutes, 10 minutes more. I think there's a little <laughs> time flies. less time. Less time, yeah. I'm afraid. Okay. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be fast. Okay. Uh, Thank you. So I select the objects, and then I can just uh, select here, hide to camera and shadow channel. So when I render this, you're going to see now what the what the shadow channel is going to look like. This is running a little bit slow because I guess of the webinar software. Um, so now of course also we get the alpha channel which is correct because we hid the the backdrop uh, from camera and the shadow channel now we're gonna get this this full uh, shadow channel now. Okay? Which we can better use to to composite later on. So you can either choose in the export options, in the render options, sorry, to save these files as a PSD. You can choose the bit depth, 16-bit, 8-bit, or 32-bit for Photoshop files. And then choose here the output mode to choose to be embedded and then any channel you wish to have. And here I also have a few custom alpha channels which I set up. So I was thinking, for example, for the for the logo, I wanted to have a separate alpha channel to better sort of target that area. 
the aluminum body because I'm thinking maybe it's going to have a little bit more noise so I want to target I want to have an alpha channel for easier selections just for the aluminum parts and so on so I'm going to render that in one go and then in the PSD file I'm going to get all those channels together and actually one thing I want to show you before I do this uh, when you're working with, with well, image editing in general, um, take care that when you save the file, you set the color space to the widest possible color space. And this is uh, the, the Pro Photo color space. And you see what happens if I pick it here. You can see here in the red logo that suddenly the, the colors just shifted and it looks very desaturated. If I switch it back to sRGB, it's going to look normal again. And don't worry about this. It's simply because the UI of the Maxwell Render interface, it's not color managed. So then the colors look screwed up if you choose another color space beside S besides sRGB. But you'll see that when you import this PSD file in Photoshop, uh, I think it has, I export it as a 32-bit file so then no color profile gets uh, attached. So then you need to assign it hey, a Mikhail. color profile. I'm sorry, yeah. I'm afraid that you'll be cut in a few seconds. Oh, why? I'm not quite sure, but I think there is a chance that this happens. So in case this happens, I just want to say thank you, big thank you to you and everyone that oh. attended. <laughs> we'll try to answer later on. Okay, well, hopefully it doesn't get cut off. Um, you can continue now, so hopefully everyone will be able to hear. Okay. Uh, so you assign the profile here when you get this pop-up. Assign a Pro Photo RGB, the same profile you selected when you exported the, the image. Okay. And you're going to see that in that case, the, uh, the render is going to look okay. You can see that the red color looks normal now because Photoshop is a color managed application. Okay, and you can see also that it automatically used that alpha channel to cut out my, my render, so that's pretty practical. And you can see that I also get all the separate shadow channels and also all the separate lights because I was using multi-light, so it's very convenient that all those alpha channels and lights and shadow channels are, are separate or are part of the, the file. So now to quickly show you, I'm just going to create a solid color. Uh, let's go to something like uh, dark blue maybe. Okay, and then I'm going to take the main shadow channel and I'm just going to put it under like this and you can see now that we get a perfect match of the shadow of the camera we don't get that little line there okay and then I'm just gonna delete this area here from the shadow channel because I don't need it it's from the spotlight uh, just take care that with the spotlights you get a little bit or a lot more noise in the shadow area of the spotlights if you see that shadow area from the spotlight so I'm just gonna delete that I'm just going to use a mask. I'm going to set this to multiply mode. So I'm going to get the shadow. <coughs> so with multiply mode, anything that's brighter than, than uh, the black pixels will get invisible. And I'm going to remove that part of the shadow I'm not interested in. Like so, and of course now you can just play with the fill and the opacity and so on. Okay, and one final thing I wanted to show you with this new PSD format or 32-bit editing in general, and I think this is new in Photoshop CC. It's a great option when you want to uh, sort of work with your render exactly like you would with your with your uh, RAW files from your photography, if you're familiar with Camera Raw. So if you go to Preferences and File Handling, 
Here you have a new option called uh, Use Adobe RAW to convert documents from 32-bit to 16-bit or 8-bit. So this is pretty great because if I have that checked, I think I had it checked. Yep, it checked. And if I change this to either 16-bit or 8-bit, and I choose to merge the, the file, you can see that it opens up Camera Raw now. Okay, and you can see right away that it sort of changes the look of your render. It gives it a little bit more pop, a little bit more contrast from the beginning. You can see here side by side compared to our renders. And especially in the highlights, it sort of changes them, making them look smoother. You can see here, especially here, you can see how the highlight looks here compared to this one. So sometimes it can be a quite a nice way to sort of make your renders look more photographic and if you want to sort of get back uh, sort of the same contrast that you have in the initial render just set the contrast to to you know a lot lower and then it gets sort of more like what it was before. I also lowered the exposure a little bit. But then you have all the tools here, especially for example the clarity. If, if you look at the leather texture here, the clarity parameter is great for bringing out that micro contrast. And many renders can have a use for that. You have the sharpening tools. So this is exactly as you would work with a photo, with a raw photo to convert it. Uh, you have the noise reduction. You can use the paint tools to, let's say, paint a little bit more noise reduction in areas that are more noisy. Okay, so the camera to raw tool is pretty nice, and doing, having that option from the file handling can be pretty nice to have. And once you have a few settings that you like, you can go also save presets. So. Uh, Hopefully I'm not talking to myself, Janice. <laughs> Are people still here? Hello? You're talking to everyone, Mihai. Luckily. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, so let me move out of this brush tool. Uh, so you have all the effects here. You have the uh, curve tools. Okay, you can have, this is a great tool to bring out, for example, just the shadows, bring out some contrast. You can see that it already looks you know, maybe a little bit more photographic than default, default render. And then you can choose to save these settings to use them later and click OK and it's going to convert that render for you. So anyway, that was a quick look at the new PSD output and uh, the useful, you know, camera raw document here in Photoshop. I guess that's about it. That's uh, great. We can take Thank some you. questions if so there are questions. Nice. We're still here and we have two questions for you. One is from Dmitro asking about the material library resources. I just wanted to add in before you go on and answer that we are currently updating the, the gallery we have, so hopefully the materials that you'll see there will be compatible with the latest version, version 3. So the question is basically whether you could recommend and advise on material resources where these could be found and used. Um, yeah, well, I guess the the official material library is still uh, the, the best source. Uh, and it, it's nice that you're going to update it. I just mm -hmm. wanted to mention uh, with my site, so it's maxwellzone.com. For now, I just have a few tutorials there if you, if you guys are interesting. But very soon, I'm going to have a whole new complete training series for Maxwell, a video series, which I'm, I've been working on it for a few months now. So it's going to be like the, the most complete video series for Maxwell 3. Uh, available anywhere and I'm also going to start having materials and models on the site so there's going to be a little shop there in about a week or so plus the training series so that's going to be a second resource I mean I intend for this site to be you know a special site just for Maxwell so it's going to have materials and tutorials and ready to render models and so on 
So yeah, awesome. <laughs> just thought I mentioned that. Looking forward, and the uh, the tutorials that you have, they already are really cool. So we recommend that you watch them as well. Yeah, yeah. The it's second very, question very nice we have one. is from Guillaume, and he says, "Is there a shift lens effect so there is no vertical distortion in a render?" Uh, yeah, that's uh, it's there since I think version two or maybe even 1.7. It's if you go to a camera. Uh, if you go to the bottom here, you have the shift lens. You can shift it up or down. You can also get a, a preview of it in the viewport. Okay, so that's the effect basically. Let's say this was a building. Okay, and you want to shift up the camera, you would use that and just shift up the camera. And also you have the horizontal shift. So that's the shift lens here. That's great. Thank you, Mihai. So far, I don't see any more questions, but you can you can post this on social media if you like. You can follow us there. We had a quick poll, actually, during the webinar to see in which uh, V3.2 features everybody is interested in, besides the ones you covered here. And people say that they're interested in subsurface scattering and motel light improvement. So maybe that could be something focus on, on in the future. Everybody's multi light interested. improvement? Yes. The multiple shifters? Oh, uh, yeah, I can show that. That's available in 3.2 3 as well. So yes. if you, if people still see my screen, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, so now you can actually just shift select several emitters. You can see here I have the main one and then these two. So I just, I just, uh, clicked in one, hold down shift, and then click the other ones I want, and then when I move one, all of them are going to move. And then holding control, you can just select this one and this one, so individual ones if you want. This one and this one, and then when I move it, it's going to move those two, like that. That's a great new improvement. Well, I hope that everybody gets to, to use V3.2 and that you found Mihai's webinar really useful. I believe you did. Thank you so much, Mihai. This was great. No, yeah, thanks. I hope it was clear. <laughs> if you have any questions, just, uh, you know, post on the forum. Uh, it's very active, so I really recommend people to register with the forums if you haven't already, and then post your questions there. Yes, please do. Thank you again.